So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the virtual visit of the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. I am Oliver Brot from Aachen, Germany, and I will be uh, moderating this evening and handing over to our two guides, Eric Butz and Klaus Roberts at CERN shortly. You see them already connected. So before that, a few technical remarks. Um, this virtual visit is taking place as part of the uh, spring meeting of the German Physical Society and the conference language is English and uh, we will be doing this visit in English as well. So um, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A tool uh, found at the bottom of your Zoom window. And if you are more comfortable posting your question in German, you are of course welcome to do that um, as well. Uh, vielleicht ganz kurz, ich habe gerade erzählt, dass die Konferenzsprache der DPG Englisch ist und wir deswegen den uh, virtuellen Besuch auch auf Englisch machen werden. Uh, wir hoffen, dass das okay ist für alle. Um, solltet ihr, sollten Sie Fragen haben, sind Sie herzlich eingeladen, die Fragen unten in dem Frage- und Antwort-Tool in Ihrem Zoom-Fenster zu posten. Wir werden dann auch darauf eingehen. So, uh, now... Let's not waste time and switch to CERN, where our two guides are already waiting for us. I wish everyone an informative evening and a lot of fun with the visit at the um, CMS experiment. So, good evening. Welcome to the CMS experiment at CERN near Geneva. My name is uh, Klaus Rabatz. I'm from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And uh, I welcome to you to our virtual visit. And uh, I just introduce a little bit the team. So Eric Butz will be our tracking adventure expert. Then we have left to me, there's uh, Zoltan, who is our director tonight. And then we have uh, Noemi, who will be our camera power woman for tonight. So it is foreseen to, to do this as follows. So there will be Zoltan and me uh, upstairs here. And we give a, yeah, I will give a very short introduction. Then I give over to Eric, who will go down to the actual CMS experiment. And in order to explain to you where we actually are, I would like to have the first slide from Zoltan. Yes, of course, sir. So if you could. In the meantime, do you want to show the, the control room, Eric? We can get ready and maybe then, yeah. then uh, yeah. we we'll start okay. going around a bit while you introduce where, where we yeah. are. Yeah. So, very quick introduction. So what you can see here on the screen is in the background, the Alps. Then a little bit before you see the Lake of Geneva. Just in front of the yellow circle, you will see the airport of Geneva. And then the yellow circle, of course, it's not visible on the surface, it's underground. This is the LHC accelerator where we have protons uh, accelerated to almost the speed of light, just 400 meters per second less. And there are eight access points, but only four are equipped with experiments. There's one close to the airport, which is LHCB. Then there's uh, the largest experiment, which is ATLAS, which is also close to the main site and the rest of the accelerator complex. Then we have uh, one which is close to the Jura Mountains, which are not on the picture. They are just behind us, let's say. This is ADIS, which is specialized to heavy ion collisions. And then we are actually on the other side, CMS, this is 0.5. And the actual experiment itself is 100 meters underground. Let me just show that. So um, here is an actual picture showing you the depth. So in fact, the accelerator itself is, is a plane. But there, because of the structure, so going down from the Jura Mountains to the right and then to the Lake of Geneva to the left, there's a slope, of course, and Alice is about 140 to 160 meters of depth. Uh, CMS here, we are at 100 meters of depth, and LHCB is about uh, 16 to 18 meters below ground. And then all these points are connected with our uh, accelerator. Uh, but this is only the last part of the accelerating complex. If you show the slide just before, you can see that we cannot put the protons directly to a speed of almost the one of light. We have different uh, other accelerators which are there for the preparation of the first beam. So just Zoltan was showing LINAC2, this is a small linear accelerator. Then we have uh, accelerators that were used in the, in the 50s, the booster and the proton synchrotron. Uh, they are still in use, of course, upgraded in the meantime. Then we have this uh, 
Synchron Proto Synchro Protocon, no, Super, Super Proton, Proton Synchrotron from the 70s. And this is the last step of the pre acceleration before, over some transfer lines, the protons are put into the uh, Large Hadron Accelerator. And then they are accelerated to something uh, that is, let's say, 13,000 GeV. It's, it's 13,000 times the mass of a proton. So, really, it's really heavily relativistic when we put these into collisions. The collisions take place within the detectors. And we, what, what, we like to, what we would like to see is, of course, we would like to see into the deepest structure of the smallest particles. And here are the four experiments to the top left. This is the largest one, ATLAS. It's about 7,000 tons, 30 meters uh, long. Um, then ALICE is a more complex one to the bottom left. It's dedicated to heavy ion collisions more, uh, and uh, needs, uh, uh, needs to be capable in order to uh, register tracks of thousands of particles at the same time. Then LHCB on the bottom right is one which is uh, structured such that the beam goes into, that we observe more details into the beam direction, which is not possible with the general purpose detectors. And here we are at CMS, so that's the top right. And here I just explained to you the letters. So C stands for compact. And I hope you will see that it's quite impressive. It's really large, 15 meters of diameters. And uh, it's the smaller one of the two experiments, but nevertheless really large. But it's the heaviest one, also 15,000 tons of weight. So that's the compact. Then we see the red and yellow parts also in this picture. So the red part is just um, part of our superconducting magnets. So it's just there to form the magnetic field. We have a nice demonstration down in the cavern. The yellow part is the muon system. So here we are measuring particles, which are, let's say, heavy brothers of electrons created in the upper atmosphere. And these yellow parts are dedicated in order to register these muons. And we are, we were, or we are still heavily interested in these because this is one of the primary channels to find the Higgs boson that decays into two Z bosons and then four muons, which are found there. And the next piece of the CMS uh, acronym is the S. This is a solenoid. So we have a strong magnet of 3.8 Tesla magnetic field. And just Zoltan is showing it here. And in the middle of this, onion-shaped detector, which gives you in total, let's say, a, a super microscope with 100 million pixels of information. In this center, we, we have the collisions surrounded by a tracking device where Eric is the expert. Then we have something that is called electromagnetic calorimeter, which is there in order to measure photons and electrons in particular. And then we have something which is the hadronic calorimeter in order to measure all the rest in terms of the energy content of these particles. Let me show it on this. Screen. Yeah, that's so on, that's on, probably yeah. so on, this is just a slice through the detector. And here we can see, for example, how we measure these particles. Let's take, for example, the blue line. So that is a muon that would be produced not in cosmic rays in the atmosphere, but in a collision. It traverses our tracking devices, leaves some points there. In the kilometers, it leaves no trace. Then there's a solenoid. And then in the outer parts, the yellow parts, interspersed between uh, the, the, the magnets yoke in red. Uh, there we have the measurement of the muons. And then all the other particles that we can measure leave either traces or pixels that are measured in the tracking devices or something in the crystals, which is the electromagnetic calorimeter. Or they leave energy, like, for example, a neutron that would be the green dashed line. It's not bent in the magnetic field. This leaves some energy here. In contrast to the neutron, proton, for example, that would have the bent track in green that also leaves energy in this kilometer. So this is a short introduction. And then uh, most important thing is this is not a movie. This is just not a presentation. It's a live virtual visit. So you can ask us questions via the Q&A at any time. And I will be there in order to either transfer the question to Eric, who will now take over in order to show you our control room. Or if there is some gap in between, I will try to answer your questions. And now I give to Eric. OK, so the first question is whether you can hear me OK. This, I hope, is the case. 
So let's assume that that is indeed the case, and you can you can hear me. So Naomi, yeah. as the I hear you loud and clear. Okay, perfect. So Naomi, Naomi hits, uh, holds the camera here, and uh, I'm now in the the main CMS control room. What you see here is uh, in the control room that is in, in two parts, and we are here in what we call the, the central area. This is where the shift crew that uh, now mans the control room are ready in 24 7, so really 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order to make sure that uh, the, the detector is uh, kept safe at all times and is also uh, we're able to take data. And what you see is that there at this moment only uh, three people and, uh, as the, the shift crew, but that has been because we only just emerged from uh, the, all of the, the COVID related restrictions. The, the restrictions were largely lifted uh, around CERN only about a, a week ago. And uh, so the, this is why I, part of the shift crew is uh, still distributed uh, around the, the world and is uh, taking in these shifts and uh, helps with the data taking remotely. This is not an ideal situation, but uh, this is what we had to work with. And obviously we had to make sure that also under these conditions, we can operate in CMS as a detector. The LHC will be starting up in uh, only a couple of uh, more weeks, really injecting beams into the, the machine in order to prepare for physics data taking in, in towards the, the summer. And that's why at this point in time already at CMS, we are, uh, have entered really operation continuously so that uh, we, you know, we can calibrate our detectors as best as possible. And uh, to, we also use uh, cosmic muons, which originate from, uh, from let's say, the, the upper atmosphere. And we can detect them with, uh, with our detector even 100 meters underground. And they are very useful to, for us to, uh, to, on the one hand, calibrate the response of our system to these particles, but also determine the, the relative alignment of the, the detector elements, for example. So the other part of the control room is uh, largely empty at this moment in time. This is owing to the hour of the day. This is where normally the uh, experts from the individual subsystems would be sitting. So you see various workstations here, which as I said, they are at this moment empty, but uh, during any working day, uh, this, uh, these stations are really bustling with uh, activities where the experts are taking care of the system. And again, trying to put them into the, the best possible shape for the upcoming data taking. Then I think at this moment in time, uh, without much further ado, I think we can go down. So uh, we then have to see, we might have seen this kind of coverage with the Wi-Fi, but if not, then uh, Klaus and Oliver will be with you and will bridge the gap. The first thing that we have to, we have to, to do is uh, pass the uh, access system. Not everybody can go underground. And so we'll try to show you a bit the procedure that uh, we have to go through there uh, in order to, to protect our uh, detector from uh, unauthorized access. So then please follow me. By the way, I can only uh, encourage, as has already been done, that uh, whenever you have any questions, you can uh, post them in the question and answers uh, window, and uh, we will try to uh, interrupt and, uh, and take up these, uh, these questions and uh, answer them on the spot. Yeah, so for the moment, nobody was brave enough. So I can only encourage you to ask questions whenever you have one. Okay. So I will now use my personal decimeter, which also functions as an access device and enter into this uh, lock. And I will then need to perform a scan of my iris. Some of you might recall this from the, the movie Angels and Demons. That's not quite you know, how it works, but uh, this is one of the precautions that uh, really we know not only that the person has a, a valid uh, access, but that is also actually the correct person that uh, enters the, the underground premises. And what's more, these devices now checking for the for the blood circulation as well. So what actually happened in the film Angels and Demons uh, is is not possible anymore. And also the apparatus that was shown in the movie is not the the exact one that we have. We used them. We used, we used them the same some time before. Yeah, but they, not they now, were the generation anymore. one yeah. devices. Now, now we are two or three generations away. Yeah, and and in fact, some pieces of the film are actually turned, uh, have actually been been made at, mm -hmm. at CERN. For example, the the nice go down onto the Atlas detector where it was not CMS but Atlas. That is real. That was uh, really done here. Partially. Because as the camera arrives down, it arrives to the control room. Obviously, that control room is not no. at the detector. Our but... control rooms are upstairs, mm -hmm. as exactly. you see. So, Klaus, we have our first different. question. Yes. In the last years, when everything was shut down, was there a shift at all time? And if yes, why? Because the detector was not running. 
Uh, in fact, no, there was not a shift at all times. There are different phases. So uh, when we are in the phase of commissioning, for example, there's no beam, etc. The detector is not fully on, but nevertheless, we have a shift crew of at least two people. One is the shift leader who is also responsible for the security of, um, of everything here. And then we have one technical shifter who takes care of the detector, uh, detector system, etc. If, for example, in, in winter shutdown or when there's not much going on on site, then there's not always a shift crew present. So we have three phases, either there's no shift crew present or two. And nowadays it will be increased to five as soon as with uh, COVID restrictions, etc., and travel restrictions, everybody can come in again. Then we will have uh, here where I'm sitting, there will be the trigger expert who takes care of the data taking. So we form about 40 million beam crossings per second. We cannot register all of this. We will take only about 100 uh, events per second that are registered. So 100 photos, you can say. Um, and then just behind me is the person that is taking care of the data acquisition so that all components of the detector are inside. Shift leader and technical shifter that were here always. And there's one expert who is looking into the data quality. So that's a data quality monitoring person. So I'm very happy that there's at least one question. So please go on and I'll try to answer. Yeah, there's another one. Are on-site visits possible currently? So a CERN change to green level that me in terms of COVID restrictions. So that means since two weeks, it was possible to go even into the experimental curve on. Um, Exactly now, it's not possible. It depends on the day-to-day -day work. And once there's beam, then it's not possible to anymore to visit the experimental cavern. But we have two caverns down, which Eric will show us in a second. There's also the service cavern where there are all, all our electronic racks. OK, so I hope we, we have the signal from uh, downstairs back. Perfect. OK, so, so you, you might have the entire time. OK, very good. Yeah, that might have been, we, we lost your signal for, for a second. You might have followed the, uh, the, the counter next to the, 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 the um, indicator of the floor. So we're at uh, the, the second lower level, or the, the minus two level. But this is actually uh, about 80 or almost 90 meters uh, underground. So we had an elevator ride of about one minute. And so we're now uh, yeah, actually down close to the, the detector. I will now, now open the door here and we enter now into what Klaus already mentioned, one of the two caverns. If we just pivot the camera upwards for, for one second, you can actually see the, the access shaft. So this is the, uh, the, the journey that we have just performed, these 80 meters down. The white structure on the left-hand side is, uh, the, is the, in the elevator shaft. Now, the one thing that is particular about this environment down here, that the elevator shaft is actually our, also our escape route. This uh, elevator shaft is under continuous overpressure. So even in the event of a, of a fire, it will not uh, act as a chimney, but it can actually be, be used as the, as the escape route from underground. So now if we move further in the, in the cabin here, we now enter into an environment that unfortunately is a, is a bit noisy. This is inevitable. We are now in what we call the, the counting room. We're not now uh, not yet close to the detector itself. In this cavern, we have a lot of the, the electronics that we need in order to operate the, the detector. And there are many aspects to, to cover here. If you just look at this rack, for example, if you show that in the label if you, uh, a bit, this is, for example, part of our detector safety system. So this is one of the, the systems that ensures that also without human attendance, the system is in a, in a safe state at all times. For this, and it uh, watches the various quantities that are relevant for the operation of the detector. This can be temperatures, this can be uh, tube points of relative humidities, or also other things. We also have a lot of the uh, readout electronics for the, the detector in, in this cavern. So what we, we typically have is the, the sensitive elements of the, the detector that are obviously inside the cavern. But then we need to get the data out for further processing. I think you briefly already touched on the, the fact that uh, we, we cannot read out, for example, all day in data, but we have to then perform some selection. And uh, most of the, the, the data gets shipped out from the detector with a certain rate. We have about 100,000 events per second that come from the detector. They will then be shipped by optical fibers, which then arrive in this accounting room. The data will then be 
be repacked in a certain, a certain way, processed, or uh, possibly reduced in a bit in uh, volume, and then it will be sent out further again via optical fibers to our computing farm, which is at the surface, which performs the second selection step where we reduce our, our rate again from 100,000 1, 100, events per second to about 1,000 events per second that we then actually write onto the two hard drives and uh, for, uh, store them for, for further analysis. This is what then actually the, uh, the various colleagues around the world can use in order to ask questions into this data in order to, for example, search for new particles like the Higgs boson, but also uh, other exotic uh, models. This is one the, the, the basis where all of them this starts. So if we now move uh, further along this, so you see we have various rec rows here and uh, not all of them always appear to be very tidy. Some, uh, sometimes one looks at these things and thinks it's a miracle that these things work at all, but actually uh, this is a very complicated uh, detector that really just needs a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, elements that need to work to, together. So it is inevitable due to the complexity that uh, you also have environments which at first glance might not be very, uh, very tidy. You might have seen at some points, no visitors beyond this point. So the advantage of this virtual visit is that Eric and Naomi can show you places where you would not be allowed to go as a visitor. And coming back to the previous question, it's not only CMS persons or friends who can visit CMS. Everybody can visit CMS. You just have to register with an official uh, CERN, CERN visit for this. Or the CMS visits. Yeah, or the CMS visits. So there's another question. Yeah. The X boson has been found already. What is CMS searching for at the moment? So that's an excellent question. We are searching for everything that can give us any indication of a new phenomena. And unfortunately, theory is a bit as a, at a loss in terms of telling us what exactly we should be looking for. So um, actually, we are trying to find in, in our most precise measurements the slightest discrepancies in order to interpret it together with our theory colleagues for something new. And Eric is just in standing of some interesting construction. So Eric, please. Yeah, this uh, I just wanted to briefly show. This is in some sense where our CMS realm ends. Uh, this uh, it, it says a forbidden door. This is actually now in the in the underground uh, in cavern. The moment where we would be, if we would go through this door, which we obviously can't, even on this uh, virtual visit, we would be entering the realm of the accelerator. So uh, then you can really see that we are very close to uh, to where the protons are then then actually being circulated. Uh, but uh, th this would be one of the, the, the doors if we would go through about 50 meters, we would be entering the, the, L the actual LHC tunnel, which would then go around uh, for 27 kilometers. We are now moving forward and we're now coming to pretty much in, in the same type of door that we just passed before. Even the, if here the, the access restrictions are yet more stringent, so I have to then go through the same procedure. And uh, I think before you go through, are you sure yet that you don't have anything precious that will be killed in the magnetic field? I, I do, yes, I did this. So now I actually, this, uh, the, the system gave me one of these keys and I first need to uh, unlock the, the door and only now the, the system actually proceeds with the access procedure that then continues as before. So again, I have to scan my iris and all of this. This key is an, is an extra safety because it re really registers in, in a dedicated fashion. I have this key with me. And if this key does not return to its uh, original place, then the uh, accelerator would be, would be blocked from, uh, from restarting. So if I now exit the, the cabin and I do not give this key, and key back and uh, take it, for example, to go skiing for the weekend, then uh, some um, of my colleagues might like me a, a bit less because yeah, they, yeah. This, is a, this is obviously a safety but, safety of personnel and feature that uh, that is very important to make yeah, sure that nobody once, can, can once eric behind. will come back from skiing he will not be sure against all the angry physicists that could not collect the valuable data over the skiing weekend where he forgot the key so we have another the, question which is how would you proceed in case of a fire in the underground so in case of fire in the underground this is a real emergency so it's if it's a really, really small one and the person who discovers it uh, feels perfectly safe to take care of it and, and extinct it, he would sound an alarm and really attack it. But normally you would just call for the fire brigade and sound the evacuation alarm. And also we are trained or we yeah. have access to the, to the underground area. We are trained how to evacuate 
what are the evacuation paths, even in some cases uh, through the through the red door you saw, because we have an elevator there, a backup elevator. Yeah. So uh, we are all trained how to how to get out from the underground area or how to get the, the safe shelter in front of the elevator where the rescue people can can find us and we can stay alive. Yeah, so so everybody who normally has access here is trained in, for example, fire extinguishing, m many of us also in uh, first aids, etc. So this is a very important thing. Then there's another question, why are there so many security measures? Are there some dangers you expect? Well, there are many dangers here, even the most simplest ones, like uh, something that has been forgotten on a, on on the way and somebody is hurting himself because he just trips his foot. So that can happen to somebody. I think Zoltan is not very enthusiastic um, while I'm mentioning it because that's something that happened to him. Yeah, but exactly. this is this is something that uh, happens like everywhere. You have all kinds of dangers like things falling from heights, which should not happen, of course. We have strong magnetic fields. We have systems which work with, uh, with gas that would be, uh, well, not um, suffocating so you don't have enough oxygen etc so for all this we have all to take precautions in order uh, to the slightest problem that appears that it's not a danger first for people and then not for our equipment as we used to say so, safety first safety first and the most important ingredient to safety is yourself okay so uh, we have now passed the, uh, the the second lock and we're now entering the uh, actual experimental cabin so we are now standing next to uh, the the cms detector and we will see that we can show you this to, to you in a in a good fashion the one thing that uh, was so, already mentioned is that we have a we have a strong magnetic field now this magnetic field is obviously invisible but uh, already as a as a first demonstration one thing i i brought a specialized uh, tool with me which is uh, just regular paper paper clips but if you have a string of paper clips, and if I just unfold them, then uh, you can already see that uh, they don't behave quite, quite as they might in your in your living room. And these are not especially prepared ones. I can bend them in whatever fashion. So what you're seeing here is that this uh, this chain of paper clips is actually following the magnetic field lines of the magnet. So this is even so in, if we have I we have in return. A, in fact, yeah, if Eric, I if I may make yeah. a, a technical comment on. on. Uh, you might see that the camera image gets a little bit blurred by time to time. This is due to the magnetic field, but I think this is a price that we should pay for this this uh, extreme show that we have today. Yeah. Also, uh, while uh, we were talking about the safety, Noemi and Eric changed the camera mount to to a non-stabilized something. So there might be some shaking in the camera image. I apologize for that, but uh, the the active uh, stabilizer wouldn't survive in the field. So, so, so Eric is now walking in this strong magnetic I think field. We are losing it's him. not. It's not the strongest one where he stands. It's m more intense inside the detector, and for that is the the red piece in order to block most of the magnetic field. What you see is just the remainder, and uh, it would be dangerous for the people who have medical implants. So, medical implants like insulin pumps or pacemakers. These would be forbidden to go down when there's a strong magnetic field. If you leave any tools not attached and you switch on the magnetic field, they can fly through the cavern and that could hurt people. So yeah. it's that's it's, why we have setters on that's, this. That's why we have uh, something attached to them and yeah. why we have these safety measures. But, and but, but uh, you see, they're all, actually, all actually people, dangling. Yeah. All people <laughs> who are doing the shifts can go can go down, but you have to have a special authorization. Not everybody from CMS can actually go into the underground cavern. Mm -hmm. so that was the next question. You want to say? Um, um, and we have 3.8 Tesla in the large magnet, which is more than 200,000 times the Earth magnetic field. And there's one question. What is the power required to run the machine? Um, I, I guess it means electrical power. So if everything is switched on, 
for the LHC and everything, I think there's something about 120 megawatts. 170, 180 170 megawatts. Even megawatts. But even in this case, all my laptops are, are running and also my desk lamp is yeah, on. So, so that's kind of the maximum power that we need. And most importantly, what do we need it for? Well, it's not necessarily for the magnets or such, it's the cooling. The cooling is really that part that takes the biggest part of the power. Um, Main power source, nuclear or fossil, where we take the electricity like everybody else from our electrical system. There's no etiquette on the electrons, whether they are coming from nuclear fission or from from uh, from wind powered systems, etc. <laughs> we are, so we, are we directly, cannot differentiate. Yeah, we are directly connected to the French grid. So you might mm. have an impression yeah. uh, what is the, the mix. But, but I think Eric has a nice view here again. Yeah exactly. yeah, exactly. We we have now uh, again uh, departed from the the regular visit route. Normally, we we could not have passed through the door that you might have been just uh, seen us pass through. So again, this is owing to uh, us having this uh, special visit, and we are now basically at one of the the, the two ends of the the CMS experiment. So in this configuration, you can't really see into the insides of the the detector. You see only the, the, the very forward and the elements, the, very, the elements that are that are from furthest outwards. But to give you a sense of scale, we are at uh, I would say about 10 to 12 meters uh, above the, the the ground level. The detector from one side to the other is about 15 meters in uh, diameter. And uh, then if we we were to look along the the cabin, the the length of the detector is about uh, 20 meter. That uh, is a rather rather large uh, experiment, but uh, it is still very compact because in this uh, uh, in this detector we have, uh, as, as Klaus already told you, about fourteen thousand tons of uh, of mass, and so we can just uh, walk a bit along this uh, this element. By the way, if we're standing now in the the center of the, the detector, the orange element that you're seeing is uh, effectively already. Uh, it's something that belongs almost closer to the to the machine than than to us. This is really just a gigantic shielding element. So the uh, the orange st structure that uh, Noemi is pointing the, the camera to, this is uh, just a large piece of uh, of iron and, and concrete. And uh, the reason that it is there is to protect the uh, the sensitive detector elements from from particles that are traversing along the the LHC tunnel. The detector itself is designed to, to record the, the collisions that happen at the very center of the, the experiment, but it is inevitable that a lot, a lot of particles are also traveling uh, uh, along the, the LHC tunnel in a fashion that we, is undesirable, and that's why we have this uh, large uh, element that uh, blocks out most of them. Just in front of that, inside of the, the green structure, this is this, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the orange structure, which has some, some red lights on it. This is actually already uh, one of our detectors. This is a detector that does not fit into the, the very central part of CMS. This is a hadronic calorimeter, and uh, it, in, it is uh, meant to catch particles that emerge from the, the collision region under very small angles to the, to the, the, uh, the particle direction. Okay, and we're moving along the, the what we call the, the balconies here. You see that I have to cross various access ladders in order to go down. And uh, obviously this uh, is, is something where, where only uh, trained personnel would be allowed. The one thing that you can, can see whenever you look into the, the detector or close to the, the detector elements, we always have these blue racks and uh, we, we need a lot of those because uh, this is where we have uh, a lot of the, the uh, auxiliary electronics that we need in order to operate the detector. That means if we can supply low or high voltage to our detector elements so that they, they can operate properly, that is something that we typically need to have uh, close by in, in, to these in detectors. Now, I'm standing here in the, next to the detector. That means whenever the, the LHC particle beams are on, first, I could not be here. And uh, then the safety system that we, that we just passed are exactly there to ensure that we, can, we cannot be in this in the cabin. But it also means that any electronics that is located in this cabin has to um, be uh, insensitive to some amount of uh, radiation exposure whenever the, the, the particles are colliding and whenever there's, there's beams circulating in the LHC, there is a certain amount of uh, radiation that we're exposed to here, not at this moment in time because the machine is, is off. But 
In addition, the uh, all of the, uh, everything that is located here has to be insensitive to these um, rather large magnetic fields that we just demonstrated for you. That is something that which in invariably means that the the, uh, the electronics that we have here it has to be specially Eric? qualified for uh, radiation tolerance and also magnetic field tolerance. Yes, please. Eric, so we have a question for you. So how yes, many please. low and high voltage power supply lines are needed for operating? <laughs> Do you <laughs> have an idea? <laughs> A lot. Well, I can I can maybe uh, just uh, take a passport to one uh, answer for one system uh, to to give a sense of uh, scale and uh, then others could uh, complement the uh, innermost in the detectors. So the uh, silicon pixel and silicon strip trackers, for example, there we are talking about uh, about 4000 low voltage channels and about 8000 high voltage channels to, to give you a sense of uh, scale. So. This is the this is the amount of uh, of, of channels we are talking. We have for the, the just for the central DIN detectors about one thousand power supply modules, where you have a, a voltage supply. You have two voltage supply units uh, in in each of them. So we have uh, two thousand uh, power supply mo uh, units that uh, that are needed just to supply the the central tra and tracking detectors. And then obviously the muon systems they cover a very large uh, surface area, and uh, there you also have uh, very many. Uh, electronics channels and also very many power supply channels that are needed. I think oh, thank I you. think the tracker has far more. Yeah. The, the, the I most think the tracker is the largest is, component. Yeah, exactly. That we have. There's another question. I think Oliver is typing an answer, but maybe you could say already. So the magnetic field is structured such that particles going per perpendicular to the beam line are deflected, not the particles directly in the beam line. But then, in addition to the large superconducting magnet of CMS. We have around 1,200 dipole magnets all around the accelerator. And then in addition to these, we have several thousand more corrector magnets. So there are additional magnets which are there by the controllers in the uh, LHC control room who, uh, who can use all these magnets in order to shape down. the field exactly that the beams stay inside the beam pipe and only collide at exactly the point they want. But the question is very good, because the, also that was a part of the question that how our magnet interacts with the beam. Uh, we always, uh, at, at every run, we, we always make a, a test on this, and we, we try to ensure, and then we know, that we don't have any uh, impact on the beam, beam path. So but the question so is very good. Uh, Each time it's checked. Exactly, it is checked, and the beam is tuned ah. such a way that it goes in the the axis, z axis. Uh, so then, of the of this this. The next question is: How many years will the LHC and CMS continue to operate and take data? So we have started taking real data with LHC collisions in 2010. Run one started in 2010 uh, and uh, took data up to 2012. Then we had a break. Another time of data taking 2015 to 2018. Uh, originally, we should have started last year with data taking, but due to COVID, that was not possible. So we would start this year. Then there will be another long shutdown. And during this shutdown, we will have a lot of improvements to mm -hmm. the accelerator, but also to the experiments. And this will go continue for still a couple of years. So the plans are far into the 2030s. So if you are interested in coming over here, we will still be there when you finish your studies or when you are ready or to not, come but over. They, they can yeah. come. So yeah. even, even better if you come before you finish your studies, then we have some interesting tasks for you. Yeah. So Eric, where are you now? Yeah, so we just uh, took uh, four flights of stairs down we, you, because before you got the vista from the, the very top of the experiment. But uh, now we, we are standing next to this uh, gigantic detector. So if uh, Noemi points the, the camera a bit uh, upwards, you can really see that uh, one cannot feel but, uh, but dwarfed by this uh, enormous detector. Now, those who might have attended the, the Atlas Virtual Visit, the, that detector is even higher. But already next to CMS, the, the, it is a very impressive the vista. You might ask yourself for, uh, about, uh, why, for example, this uh, detector element has the, the cables going down in this straight, uh, rather strange fashion into these uh, cable trenches. The reason for this is that this detector element is actually movable, and we're actually standing next to a, a garage in, way in which this uh, detector can be, can be stored. And that is something that is actually done during every long shutdown like we just had. So one of the first things is that the, this very forward or detector element 
uh, gets lowered to the, the cavern floor and then gets moved into these, uh, this, these garages. And the reason for that is that this then creates additional space in the cavern that we can use in order to open up the detectors. And that is something that then allows us to perform various maintenance operations also on the detector elements, which are on the inside. Otherwise you, you have uh, here a very monolithic structure, which is obviously needed once the, the magnetic field is on to really confine the, the magnetic field and also to make sure that we have hermeticity. That we, means we have no particles which, are, which can escape our detecting elements. But whenever there is a maintenance period, we really need to open up the detector instant to make sure that we can also reach uh, the, the inside. And for that, we need space. And that's why CMS is in this uh, rather oh, modular uh, fashion uh, construction that we can, can open it. Yes. Eric, CMS is about 20 meters long, right? So how, how does it work to open it up? So I, I think I remember we have five primary slices with a magnet in the middle and then three on each side in order to close the cylinder. So how does it work to move these pieces actually? Um, okay, we, we can we can maybe stay if we, I was was about to show you the elements, but indeed let's uh, let's maybe just uh, stay here close to where we where we are, just to again give you an idea. We are standing here, and uh, each of these detector elements is about uh, maybe two meters in width, actually not even two meters in uh, in width. And uh, then if you you point downwards, now image to the the orange structure. These are uh, orange feet that you're seeing here. They're not, they're not so much feet on which this, uh, the, the detector really rests, but these are on high pressure air pads. So there we can apply a pressure of I think 50 bars or so. And what happens uh, when you do this is that you will actually lift up this, uh, this detector element by a few uh, centimeters, one or two centimeters. And uh, that means this detector element, despite the fact that, that it weighs several hundred tons, it at that moment really hovers. And if you point towards the end of the, the cavern, what you see there is a winch system. And uh, we can then literally attach all of these detector elements to this winch system and pull them uh, into uh, away from, from their original position so that we can then reach the, the inside. A fun oh. fact for, for, for uh, along these lines, for geological reasons, the LHC tunnel is uh, ever so slightly inclined. Uh, and that means there is a very slight gradient in uh, the, this cavern. And, uh, that, and that means that if uh, the, the side that we're standing on is very slightly higher than the other side of the cavern. So that means the moment you're lifting up these detector elements, you actually have to pull them uphill. And whenever they are on the other side of the, the detector, if you would just leave them uncontrolled, they would actually sl slowly slide and slide down all by themselves. Now that is obviously so, something that we're not, not doing. We're always con tightly controlling them, but that's what would, would happen. So it's a kind of hovercraft, our detector, right? So why, why is it? Because we have cranes in the cavern. Yeah, we have uh, cranes. We can actually uh, look overhead, but uh, any kind of crane that uh, that you see uh, around here is really uh, just to to do the, uh, the the small works. The lifting capabilities of the the crane, I think, is about uh, 20 tons. And uh, even the the lightest elements, the the detector element that uh, that I just pointed to, this very forward one, already weighs about 300 tons. So it is uh, completely prohibitive to try and uh, lift up any of these detector elements. The uh, the cranes and the cavern are really just used uh, for, for the light work. And light here means everything up to 20, uh, 20 tons. So and in, fact, in fact, we have the question, what does one need to study in order to work hands-on these detector components? So um, the collaboration of CMS is composed about, uh, of about 3,000 people. Most of these people are either physicists, engineers, or inform information technology experts. So if, if you would like to study anything in terms of electrical or mechanical engineering, or if you study physics or something in the, in the terms of computing, then you could come to CERN and participate in one of these uh, big experiments. Exactly, so it is very important that yeah. you don't need to be a physicist. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's either we are or three, yeah. but, but we don't, you don't need to study physics only. In, in fact, we need engineers because if, so physicists try to measure something to the, to the best they can. Usually something that comes out is something that would be, uh, let's say self-destroying. We would be all in danger. I wouldn't, the I wouldn't uh, formulate it yeah, this way, the, but the engineer engineers can make they, it. They, can, they <laughs> pass by and say, oh, we will never, never, ever manage to do this. And in the end, in the communication, the engineers, oh, we could do more than we thought. And the mm -hmm. physicists, Okay, we couldn't get as far as we wanted, but we have something that works. Exactly. And in the exactly. end, uh, everybody works together in order to get this uh, 
working and uh, measuring our, our precious data. And what's more, at this level, the, the border between the engineer and physicist uh, vanishes. Yeah, so just, many yeah. of us are so, doing engineering work. Just so, many of the engineers yeah. understand what we want to have. Uh, sorry yeah. about the, the quality of the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to show you, you might be able to, to make this out badly. We're really standing now very close to the detector. The magnetic field is very high. But here you can somehow uh, maybe guess this uh, modular structure of the, the experiment because we're now pointing at exactly one of the, the gaps in between these gigantic elements. And you can just about make out the, the other side. So you see really light shining through all of this. So it is inevitable that there are small cracks. One of the things that you see, for example, at the, the, the top here, Noemi might be able to point to it, is that there, there are cables and, uh, and all kinds of pipes that emerge from all over the, the detector because we have uh, about 130 million uh, elements, but we have to make sure that all of these detector elements are powered. We have to make sure that the data can, can be read out. We have to cool these detectors sometimes to, uh, to quite heavily sub-zero temperatures to about minus 20 degrees for some of the, the detector elements. So all of these, this uh, what we call services, we, we have to bring in and out of the, the detector. So the, the, the all cables. To... And we all have to make it work in strong magnetic fields. You have seen that our camera is a little bit confused it is not by the magnetic for this. field. It yes. is not designed for And this. there was also some slight whizzing noise in the sound. We are sorry, very sorry for that, but that uh, is a, is a bit of unavoidable. The sound was more or less yeah. okay. Yeah. I think it is due to the, the background noise is, is so, very high there. And our yeah. uh, noise yeah. reduction algorithm no. might sometimes uh, make crazy things. So, and another question is, uh, when is a high luminosity upgrade to? So that's in fact after the after the next long shutdowns so for a couple of years. There are two questions in this question. Yeah. Um, so which one? Which two questions? Uh, the the hundred uh, TeV. Yeah, that's so, another. So that's another that's a, thing. That's another so, thing. So the hundred TeV upgrade. In fact, this is not an upgrade of the LHC. This is a new accelerator, including a tunnel. And, and this tunnel would be 100 kilometers. I think that the 100 refers to 100 kilometers, not 100 TeV. Yeah, the the 100 yeah. TeV also. Yeah, but they are talking about 80 to 100. Yeah, it depends, it depends how strong magnets kilometers. We, are, we are able to And this to is make. a new tunnel that would be even much larger. The current LHC tunnel is on only 27 kilometers of circumference. Mm -hmm. This is just a planned project and uh, if you just start your studies, then you might have a chance to work on it if it is constructed at some time. Uh, personally, I myself will not be working on the 100 TV project anymore, I believe. Maybe, maybe I will maybe, not either. Maybe, so. yeah, okay. so we have to see. Well, maybe um, just uh, one, one thing, I don't know if you're, you can see the picture, it might be a bit uh, obscure. What we're doing right now is we are pointing the camera upwards into uh, the uh, large access shaft, which really goes uh, straight 100 meters down from the, the surface hull of the, the CMS experiment. And uh, this is the access shaft through which uh, all of these detector elements that you can, uh, can see, all of these large detector elements that weigh somewhere between 300 and 2,000 tons, they were lowered through the shaft down to the, the floor of the cavern and then were put in place. CMS was uh, largely assembled and also um, commissioned at the surface. And then we didn't have one of these uh, yellow cranes that we just talked about a second ago, but a, a highly uh, specialized uh, crane that was used in order to, to lower these detector elements, as I said, up to 2,000 tons in an operation that took about uh, eight hours, uh, the, these uh, 100 meters uh, underground. I have a very good question about the geological yeah. Uh, uh, shape. Yeah, so the geological shape of LHC tunnel is slightly changes over time. That's a question, Eric. So do is there a source of error for the detectors yes. and how do you compensate for the tunnel deformation? I, I know the I, answer. So the, I know from the previous accelerator that was inside, the lab accelerator, this was so precise in terms of center of mass energy of the electron-positron collisions that you could measure underground with the with the lab accelerator you could measure the deformation of the earth by the moon mm -hmm. you could even measure high water levels in the surrounding lakes 
Uh, and you could even measure when the TGV is well, coming at the weekend. But that was a different story. Yeah, that's yeah. a different story. But that's less to the that's uh, to the grounding of the electricity, so, not so to I the think deformation. The, the proton proton accelerator yeah. works the same way, but in addition to to what we discussed, uh, the the underground galleries behave like bubbles in in a very dense. Uh, uh, honey, let's say, yeah. and and actually the CMS uh, counteracts with this, and the CMS keeps the height or the depth, but the tunnels raise up a little bit, and and actually uh, before each run we can we can adjust the magnets in front of the the experiments and also in the the uh, next accelerator parts in order to keep. The, the exact position of the beam. Yeah. So so we have to correct for these uh, for these uh, changes in shape and and we do. There are two more questions. I try to to answer uh, one quite fast. Why is one not allowed to access the tunnel with the beam line even if the experiment is turned off? So for security reasons, for yes. sure. And then there's not only beams, or if there are no beams, uh, you could say there's no danger from radiation. Let's say, but the magnets are filled with liquid helium, and there's always the danger of a leak of the liquid helium, for example. So for that reason, for security reasons, mm -hmm. it's usually not possible to access the tunnels. But you see here, for example, I have the CERN Open Days <laughs> T-shirt. There are special occasions. Just, there are special occasions. Just yeah, show, just, show just, again. Yeah. So here, CERN Open Days. Huh? And in these special open days, of CERN, you are able to visit even the LHC tunnel. So that is possible, but we really have to make sure that not only our equipment, but in particular, you as a visitor are safe. Exactly, so that's and, also the only what concerns, and also what concerns yeah. the, the activation by the beam. So visitors can only go on places which are so-called declassified, what concerns the radiation. Yeah, the so visitor platform, can be declassified for the, the year end stops and for the long shutdowns where, where Eric is now. So Otherwise, maybe, we don't declassify the whole yeah, Maybe Maybe I should explain a, a little bit. So, um, of course, if the beam is switched off, there's no beam anymore and no radiation directly from the beam. But the material around the beam and everything that has been hit can be activated. And in particular, close to the beam line, there is material that still is kind of hot radioactively and you need to control every bit of this in order to then what Zoltan mentioned declassify the zone as a radiation zone or not and where Eric is right now staying and explaining to us in a, in a minute here this is the visitor platform which is one of the places that can easily be declassified in order to uh, bring visitors in yeah, because it's so further far. further enough far <laughs> enough from the beam line so Eric Eric? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, yeah. We're sorry. We, we just said the, the microphone switch off for a second. Indeed. So we're now basically where we, we started on our tour. But uh, maybe as was already explained, this is indeed the uh, the zone when that uh, is, I mean, if you, know, if you point, for example, to the far end, you see that there we have a sign that indicates a radiation area at that door. And we also have the, the other door, which again extend, indicates a radiation area. But where I'm standing, this, uh, this balcony, is uh, exactly where, where uh, an area that is uh, low enough in radiation level that during long shutdowns like the one that we had right now, or also the uh, the winter stops, we can really bring also public visitors. The radiation, the activation levels here are low enough that there is uh, no danger that is being posed. So in some sense, if you are uh, thinking about coming to CERN at some point and you might try to profit from one of these occasions, the vista that you have here we are just about at the, the, the level of the, uh, the, the beam pipe, so where the particles from the LHC would be coming into to the hall from the, the right hand side and would at the center of the, the experiment meet their counterparts coming from the other side. This is a vista that during the, the, these technical stops would be really accessible also to, to visitors from the public. Obviously, in a situation like uh, right now, when the start of beam operation is imminent, we at some point have to really close the, the caverns for visitors for good. But uh, this is a possibility that uh, at the right moment in time is uh, available to, to everybody. So if you, if you could go, just go back to the red piece, there was some kind of uh, half moon and star or something. Mm -hmm. So wh where yeah. does this piece come from? 
This, uh, if you can uh, read the fine print, it comes from, uh, from Pakistan. So this is uh, actually the, uh, everything that is read here in, is, a, is a passive element. So this is uh, what we call the, the, the forward, uh, the, no, the yoke end cap part number, number four. It is a, is a shielding element that shields the, the sensitive detector elements that are just behind it, again, from stray particles that enter the, the cavern. And uh, this was contributed in large parts or in the, the, the pieces produced from uh, our partners in uh, Pakistan. So that's uh, again, one of the, the examples where CMS really is a worldwide collaboration and where really also parts are being assembled in, in various places uh, around the world. This was a uh, very heavy mechanics. And uh, yeah, this was uh, is a contribution from, from an institute in, in Pakistan. So, yeah, so in fact, there are about more than about 50 countries, 100, more than 150 institutes all over the world who agreed to CERN and CMS in order to work uh, and collaboratively and peaceful together in order to build our detector. And then everybody can, uh, can share the data and can evaluate the data. Everything is open to the public. That is the principle of CERN. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the examples. Uh, something that we cannot see right now is the, the yellow pieces of the muon chambers. Part of these have been constructed in Aachen that will probably be uh, making uh, Oliver a bit happy. The tracking parts, part of these are built in Karlsruhe. So that will make my Karlsruhe these people are happy. These are buried in the yeah, detector. Yeah. So, I think the, the BT chambers that were produced in Aachen are the so-called MB1s. So they are the closest to the, to the magnet. Yeah. The, the innermost ones of the four layers of, of muon chambers. Uh, the other other layers were produced in Italy and, and Spain. Yeah. So what this? so whatever you see here, everything it's a collaborative effort of uh, of three thousand people all over 5, the world. Thousand. Five thousand yeah, in the meantime. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. always growing. It's always growing as the data analysis requires more and Eric, more people. And yeah, and what we're, what we're showing here, in some sense, if we can go a bit closer, this is in some uh, this is the the vista that you could get a get a slight hint on. These are, this is one of the iconic pictures that uh, you might also find on the web. But uh, if you now remember where we have uh, just walked around uh, on the, the the balconies, we also went uh, to to a similar place. So whenever we are in uh, in a um, period of uh, of a shutdown and when the detector is really open for maintenance access, then uh, you can really uh, see the inside and here. You can indeed, uh, as Klaus already explained earlier, um, guess the, the various detector elements that we also just described. So I think we are coming a bit close to the program's time limit. So Oliver, whenever we should stop, uh, you, you can tell us. Eric, yeah, I, you, I you just must... wanted to shortly yeah. interrupt you and uh, I wanted to say exactly this. So um, we reached uh, our one hour limit and uh, also, the program will continue with a science slam. So I guess many of our um, visitors will continue with this uh, later tonight. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Klaus. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, Zoltan and Noemi. Uh, Noemi got a special compliment for her camera work. So very good. Thank you. Let, let, let me yeah. maybe take the opportunity to just turn, turn around the camera for one second. Yeah. This is Noemi, who has been diligently doing uh, all of the, the heavy camera, camera work. So thank you, Noemi. Yeah, so I guess this would be the last chance for a question. Otherwise, uh, we would stop our virtual visit here. Just another question pops up. Let me read it. Oh, just it says, thank, you. thank you a lot. I think this is a nice uh, last word for our virtual visit. So thanks for joining. Uh, thanks again, the technical team. Thanks again, Klaus and Eric. And uh, have fun with the rest of the DPG meeting this week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very have much. Nice evening. Ciao, ciao.